On May 9, 1864, during the Civil War, it's in a pretty amazing story about one of the more successfuls at that time, uh, successful generals at that time. His name was Major General John Sedgwick. His troops knew him as Uncle John. He was one of their favorites. Uh, this particular event happened at a place called Spotsylvania in Northern Virginia. And, and Uncle John was overseeing the placement of a battery at the rear of his troops there. They were about a thousand yards from the Confederate line. And he was uh, overseeing what they were doing and at the same time talking with his chief of staff, a guy named General McMahon. As they visited, McMahon actually wrote about this event. Uh, from time to time, stray bullets would come whizzing by and uh, Uncle John seemed completely unconcerned. His belief, actually what he said was, there was no way that they could hit an elephant at the distance they were from the front line. And yet, just a very few seconds later, uh, Uncle John was hit right in the face and fell dead at General McMahon's feet because he had made a crucial error, one that we tend to make all the time, and that is he underestimated the power of the enemy. What a sad end for a, a man who was greatly loved, a man who was very successful and who would have gone on probably to many more successes. He actually was the highest ranked officer to be killed in the Union Army during the entire Civil War. I begin with that story only to say that it is possible for you and I to make the same mistake that Uncle John did. That is, it is possible for us to underestimate the enemy. We are in a battle. We may never serve in the military. We never may be on a physical battlefield. But the truth is, is that you're engaged and I'm engaged in a war all the time with a very real enemy, one that we often don't see, one that if we make a mistake, we will be completely unaware of, and yet one that is constantly working to work against and to destroy our very life. Every believer is engaged in that kind of battle. Every believer is engaged in the battle for freedom, personally, a battle for their family and for the success of what God wants to do in their life, a battle for the future, or even a battle for the world. And over the next eight weeks, what we want to do is take a look at some of the characteristics that the enemy has and some of the ways that God has given us, prepared us even, to be ready for the battle so that you and I would not make the same mistake that Uncle John did, but that we would be prepared. We would not be naive. We would not overestimate or underestimate what the enemy can do. The section of scripture that we're going to look at is found in Ephesians chapter 6, one that you may be familiar with. It's about the armor of God. And we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 18 over the next eight sessions. And I just want to read the text in its entirety to you as we begin. So you can turn in your Bible. It'll be on the screens if you want to read there. It reads like this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Today we're going to look at the first three verses of that text and we're going to focus on understanding the enemy. We must understand our enemy if we are going to be prepared to respond to his attack. We see a couple of characteristics very quickly in those verses, and I'm always amazed at how rich those three verses are in telling us some details about the enemy. And if you want to follow along in your notes, we're going to be in the section called The Enemy's Attack. I'm going to learn a couple of things about the, the enemy. Number one, the enemy has a plan, and that plan is cunning. We have a smart enemy. He's not silly. He's not stupid. He has a strategy. 
Uh, he oftentimes doesn't make the same mistakes over and over again. He is studying us, and that's why we're studying him today, because we want to be prepared. When we see in verse 10 where it says the schemes of the devil, he is one that makes plans. He doesn't just go off without making a plan of attack. Uh, you'll, you'll see this oftentimes because he will many times attack you in different ways on different days, depending on what your mood is, what your attitude is, how prepared you are. Some days he will be very quiet and other days he'll be very loud. Some days he'll come uh, almost in a gorilla-like way where uh, we won't see him coming. Other days he's almost so in your face that you can't miss him because he has a plan and he's seeking to execute it. His plan is always for your destruction and for my destruction to destroy every good thing that God wants to do in our lives is his plan. Now, in talking about the enemy and in talking about the way that he brings temptation and the way that he brings his attacks to us, I just wanna make a very brief comment about the three sources of temptation that the enemy uses. When we're talking about the enemy, we're talking about the devil and his demons, his army, which we'll speak about more in a moment. But we make the mistake sometimes of just seeing the enemy as just a one type of unilateral view of, a, of an individual. But the reality is, is that when we are dealing with uh, temptation, when we're dealing with the attacks from the enemy, they come in three different arenas. It's, uh, first of all, the enemy himself, that's what we're talking about right now. Secondly, the world is a source of temptation. It's a source of, of us dr being drawn towards sin. And thirdly, our flesh, the flesh, the enemy, the world, and the flesh. Many times when we're talking about or thinking about the strategy of the enemy, we forget that sometimes it's just our flesh that has been stirred up. Sometimes just lust in ourselves, a lust for something, a lust, a desire to buy something that I don't need, a desire to get something that I want. That's my flesh speaking or desire to say something that I shouldn't say. Uh, that's the flesh. The world is a spirit that exists all around us all the time. It's the spirit of the world that is influencing the way we think about things. It's often in contradiction, almost always in contradiction to the word of God. And then finally, the enemy himself. And his, he is a source of tripping us up and tempting us in many different ways. The second thing we can know about the enemy is that he is not human, but he is demonic. Right? He's not flesh and blood, is what it says in the verse. Um, he is a spiritual being. We know from scripture that he is a fallen angel. He's, he's a prince. He was once a prince in heaven and now is a fallen prince known as the prince of the earth. And he has dominion over this place called the earth. But he is a created being. And he has many uh, associates that are with him. Uh, he has an army that's with him of other fallen angels. We see from the Old Testament that uh, it's about one third of the angels of heaven that went to work with Satan when, when he rebelled against God. And so he's a real person, but he's a created person. He's not equal with God. He's not in any way the opposite of God. He is simply a created being that is arrayed against God. And that is why we must be cautious and wary and smart. But we need not be fearful because he is no match for our Heavenly Father. He's no match for God in heaven because God has no match and no equal. And the enemy ultimately is a defeated foe. Number three, we need to know that the enemy has power. There are three terms that we see in verse 11. Uh, the term authorities, powers of this dark world, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. These three descriptors of the kind of enemy that we face. Now, some would say by looking at the Greek there of those words that maybe what Paul is talking about when he's talking about the enemy is he's talking about, when he says authorities, he's talking about different hierarchies, even in, in, in the spiritual realm, that there are higher demons than others that have authority in different places. And that may be the case, it may not. But the, the point is, is that there is an organization that is arrayed against the kingdom of God. It's arrayed against you and I and the purposes of God in our lives. Uh, and and it, it is a cosmic power, that is, it is an invisible power that is, that is uh, personal. It's not human, it's personal, but it is very, very powerful. It's very organized. There, there, is a, uh, there is a leader and there are followers in the kingdom of the enemy. Now, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world, meaning that there is power that, that he has, the enemy has, Satan has over the world. Now, he doesn't have authority because all authority has been given to Jesus, 
but we still have the enemy here ruling in this place. John actually says in 1 John 15, 19, that the whole world is under the power of the evil one. So while the ultimate authority is with Christ because he has won the victory and the enemy is a defeated foe, we do not yet see that fully in place because we still see history working itself out and God is bringing many in to the fold and he's still at work here on the earth. The kingdom of God is expanding in this place, but the enemy still has power and he is still pushing back against the kingdom of God. The fourth thing that we learned there is that he is wicked. He is wicked. See, power by itself is neutral. It's neither good nor bad. But what we know here from these verses, when it says the powers of this dark world, and also it says the spiritual forces of evil, we, this is a description of the kind of power that is arrayed against us. It is a dark power. It is an evil power. The enemy thrives in darkness. He, he does not like the light. He likes the things of the darkness. John 10.10 10 says that the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. 1 Peter 5.8 says the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And just one more verse, what we know about the enemy, 1 John 3.8, the Son of God, that is Jesus, appeared to destroy the works of the devil. We don't make deals with the enemy. We don't have to be uh, afraid of him. But we must know about him that he has no good in him. He has no moral code. There is nothing that he will not do to try to destroy the work of God in you. And so there is never any truce that we can make or hope to make with the enemy because he will always seek our destruction. Now, we have a powerful enemy. We have an enemy that's intelligent. He's making plans. We have an enemy that's personal, but what are we to do in response to that? Well, we're going to talk about the armor of God in the coming sessions, but in these verses, I think the very first thing that we, to, we need to know, and again, this is in your notes, is that we need to know the source of our strength. What is the source of our strength? And it's right there at the very beginning of the verses when it says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There is no use talking about any of the armor of God unless we first start with this principle. The source of all of our strength, the source of any power that we have, the source of any authority we have, if we're ever going to be effective against the work of the enemy, we must know that the power comes from God himself. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And if we place ourselves there first, then our foundation is secure. If we forget that principle, we find that we're relying on ourselves. Sometimes we're relying on our natural wisdom or relying on good principles, relying on some advice that we've received. And we try to do things that are good, but ultimately all those will fail unless we find our foundation and our source in God himself. The second thing that we need to know, the second way we need to respond uh, to the enemy is that we have to be dressed in the right armor. You need to get dressed in the right armor. Verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. Now, again, an underline here that it's the Lord's armor, not your armor. It's the Lord that is the source and it's the Lord that's the creator. So when we put on the armor of God, when we begin to pick up the weapons of our warfare, we are putting on armor that God owns and that he has fit to us. It's not something that we have made for ourselves. It's not something that we have earned or gained by anything that we have done, but rather it is something that is given to us to help us in the battle against the enemy. And we must know that. We must know that his armor is perfectly fitted to us because it's not made by us, but he has made it for us. I think of Colossians 3.12 that says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves, it says, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I love the phrase there, clothe yourself. This is a choice to pick up kindness, to pick up humility, to pick up gentleness, and actually to put it on almost as you put on a piece of clothing, almost as if you would put on armor. And here is what we're talking about. Putting on the armor of God is a choice that you and I make 
that we take up the sword of the Spirit, that we take up the breastplate of righteousness, that we put on the shoes that are shod with the gospel of peace. And day by day, we take his armor and we put it on. And then the third thing that we need to do to be ready is that we just simply need to be prepared for the attack. You need to know that the enemy is going to attack. I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't always know how, but I do know that it's going to happen. Things can be going very well in your life, but the enemy is waiting for an opportunity to destroy you. He's waiting uh, for a, an inroad into you, for, for a, a, perhaps a bitterness that would arise in your heart or a judgment against someone else or a, a piece of, of lust or t a temptation that pulls you in a certain way so that he can get a hook in you. Well, he's always going to do that. He's always going to try to do that. It is just simply silly if we would not expect it. The thing is not to fear that he's going to attack us. We don't need to be worried that he's going to jump out at us. What we need to be is prepared that he is going to attack. He's going to shoot his fiery darts. He's going to look for weaknesses in our armor. He's going to look for ways that he can ingratiate himself and find a way into our home. But if we are prepared, knowing, ready, that he is going to be on the attack, then we, then we also can be on the attack. We can be prepared for what he is going to do. The next couple of weeks, we'll be talking more about each individual piece of armor and, and the meaning of each one and how you can equip yourself with them. But for today, what we want to focus on is understanding and being prepared for the enemy's strategy. As you discuss today, enjoy.